Hello interwebs, welcome to our Let's Fix Computers. I have a custom build here, which uh, came in today. Uh, apparently it is crashing and locking up in games and stuff like that. Um, not a huge amount of feedback from the customer of exactly what was going wrong with this thing, just that it was just crashing when gaming, that kind of thing. As you can see, it started and booted up just fine, so that's fine and dandy. So. Um, before I go much further, we're going to do a quick visual inspection on the inside and we're going to see if we can see any screaming faults um, that might be causing an issue. Uh, then we'll go to the software and we'll see if there are any screaming faults that might be causing an issue. And we'll move forward from there. So, uh, let's go in a little bit close here because there's a couple of things that I spotted while I was plugging it all in that I want to point out. Um, so, again, just doing a tour around the cables, we've got... The reset button is in the wrong place. That guy should be in there. There we go. That's not going to cause it to crash, but still, it was in the wrong place. What is that spot even for? Oh, that was that was in case intrusion. So that's not going to do anything there. Oh well. Um, let me see. Moving around as well. I don't like this. Uh, this is the rear fan cable, and it's got a 4-pin Molex lead that's just flapping around in the breeze. That's 12 and 5 volt hot, that, that wire. And the Molex connector is rather exposed, so I don't like that being there at all. If you've bought a budget case that has come with one of these fans that has the 3-input um, the 4-pin, um, that has the Molex tail on it, just chop the tail off. Don't use it, just chop it off. We'll be doing that in a minute. I'm just going to lock that off. No one uses Molex for their fans. You're always going to be using 3-pin or 4-pin four, four PWM. So yeah, that's not ideal. I don't like this down here. Let me see if I can get you a good shot of that. You see the EPS connector? It looks kind of jammed in there. Um, now, it's the correct way around, but just that just doesn't look happy. I don't like the look of that at all. Uh, again, that might be a bad connection there. One of those might not be in properly. So we've got some just general scragginess on this. I'm not sure if this is a... I'm not sure if the customer built this machine um, or whether this is an off-the-shelf thing from somewhere. The spec looks okay. Um, we've got a Cooler Master 600 watt power supply. That'll be fine. Um, we're in an Aerocool case. Not one of their best ones in my opinion because um, it's... No, very bad venting on this front panel. However, it's not using any fans up front anyway, but nah. And like, you know, this fan here, this isn't screwed in properly. And just, yeah, like that has gone in and it's gone solid, but that's because the hole isn't tapped is correctly. And just, there's little rough edges around this build. And sometimes just lots of little rough edges like that might just be the gremlin in your system. So that's not ideal. Um, the rest of the system, yeah, it looks okay. Motherboard is a B450M DS3H. <clears throat> I like this motherboard. It's a, it's a low-end motherboard. However, I've never had an issue with a DS3H, so no beef there. Uh, it's a 1050Ti, 4GB. Uh, so the graphics card is modest, but okay. Uh, it looks like we've probably got 16 gigs of RAM there. Yeah, that's 16 gigs of 3200 RAM, so good RAM. No idea what CPU is under this cooler, um, so we'll find out what that is in just a moment. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to log in and I'm going to try and reproduce the fault. So let's sign in. So I've logged into the computer and I've plugged in my toolkit flash drive. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to stick on Intel burn test and hardware monitor. And we're just going to do a very quick sanity check. So we'll fire up hardware monitor and just see what this looks like. All right, so that is uh, a Ryzen 5 2600X. Not bad. And our package temperature is sitting at 40, the high 40s um, at idle while it's chuntering away doing something in the background. So let's fire up burning test and I'm just going to quickly hit this with a load. Oh, God damn it. Guess I'll get .NET. 
Yes, I'm aware that uh, Cinebench is a better way to load down a CPU. However, usually Intel burn-in test is faster because I just copy it from the flash drive. I don't have to install anything. Okay, so our package power usage has spiked up by about tenfold. We're at 100% processor usage and our temperatures are rising steadily. So we'll just see what this does. I'm going to leave it to run for... I don't know, 10 or 15 cycles and just see where the temperatures go. I'm expecting the temperatures to soar up to um, the, the 80s on this thing. Ah, what ho? Intel burn-in test failed. Critical error, your system was found to be unstable under Intel burn test. Cool. So, apparently our temperatures only hit 76 degrees. I say only, 76 degrees is a little on the toasty side but that's entirely predictable for the setup we've got here. Uh, a Ryzen on its stock blower, 76 degrees, yeah, that'll happen. Um, so, yeah, however, we actually didn't get through the Intel burn test, so something is up. Now, we've achieved two things at this point. Um, firstly, we've seen that there is something going on, but also we now have uh, reproducibility. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to restart the computer and I'm going to run the same test again. And that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cycles. So I'm going to run that same test again and see if it can get um, further than seven cycles without it crashing. Um, Intel burn test should be able to run for as many times as you wanted to. I've got it set to 100 cycles at the moment. So if it can't get as far as seven, then we've immediately found how to reproduce the problem. And that is the key to being able to solve the problem, is being able to reproduce it. So uh, let's restart and confirm that. It got a lot further this time. However, again, it has failed mid-test. I'm not going to go through and count how many cycles it did. However, uh, yeah, we left it run I left it running for, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, and it's conked out. Um, yeah. Intel burning, it's been a long time since I've seen a computer that has failed to get through Intel burning test. Normally you're doing this just to see what the temperatures are doing, not as a stability test. I don't consider Intel burn test to be a stability test. Um, however, as I say, it's a very quick just, you know, I have not installed anything. I've just dragged hardware monitor and IBT onto the desktop, run them, and we have error messages. So we've got a reproducible fault now it's time to start making changes to the computer. So the first thing I'm going to do is we're going to shut this thing down and we're going to fix all those little things I don't like on it. Well, uh, the, the fan and that EPS connector. That EPS connector, that is my current theory. Uh, I don't like the look of that at all. Um, so I'm going to settle that all out and then we'll go through and we'll run the same test again and we'll see if we get the same result. And if that doesn't fix it, the next stage will be to start running other tests to see if we can start narrowing it down. Other theories that are in my head at the moment, or the next most prevalent theory, would be memory issues. Uh, and that could be an issue with XMP or, uh, or perhaps bad modules. So um, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to straighten this out, see if that fixes it. If it doesn't, I'm going to move on to doing some memory tests to see if any of those trip the system up as well. Because remember, although Although Intel burn test is designed to stress the CPU, um, there's more going on with it. And issues like memory issues will cause all kinds of problems throughout the entire system, regardless of the test you're running. You have to bear in mind that um, although a lot of tests are designed to stress specific components, you can still get false positives as a result of other failures in the system. For example, uh, with a, with, if, if it turns out to be a CPU issue, then we might get issues running a graphics card stress test because a graphics card stress test is still going to put load on the CPU as well. So this is where the this is where diagnostics turns into not so much a run this, run this, run this, run this. It's more a matter of gathering information until you have enough uh, enough flags to make an educated guess as to where your problem is. So yeah, uh, let's shut this down and tidy this up. So if you're watching this thinking, oh man, that, that loose cable, that's not gonna be the problem. You might well be right. However, in diagnostics, 
you've got to change one thing at a time. And if, if you want to actually find out what the problem was, it was anyway. If we go in and we just chart, start changing a whole bunch of stuff, and we do a load of tests and stuff like that, if we do too much in one go, we won't know what was actually the issue, which is bad because that means we can't make any preventative measures to stop it happening in the future. So we're just going to do things at one step at a time. Well, two steps at a time. I'm going to lock this guy down here off. That's not going to be our issue, but I'm just going to take it off anyway because it doesn't need to be there. I'm currently just removing this back fan so I get better access to the EPS connector. Oh, am I going to have to take out the CPU? Oh, there we go. It's out. Okay. We don't have a lot of slack on this, which might be what caused the problem in the first place. Okay, the connectors are not deformed. That looks fine. I think I'm just going to clip these guys back together again and put it back in. Okay, that guy hasn't gone back together again in a very convincing manner. But it has reconnected. There we go. All right, there we go. That just literally just went click into place now, and that looks much tidier. Again, I'm not giving you guys a great view of that. However, there you go. As you can see, that guy's nice and straight now. That's that fan cable sorted out. Um, I think that's about it. I'm going to put this fan back in and then we're going to take the backside panel off as well just to make sure there's nothing going on there. And also, I need to reverse this fan because this fan was in this way. So it was blowing down into the case, uh, which is the wrong orientation. It should be this way around so it's exhausting out the top of the case. Huh. The hell? Oh. Oh, that's fun. Right, they so someone hacksawed off that corner to clear the EPS connector. I wonder if that's why the EPS connector was all wonky, because someone had been trying to wrestle that fan into place. Hmm. All right, is this just an unfortunate configuration of this case? Let me just see if I can fit that in. Uh, yeah. All right, well, that's the mystery solved of why this was like this in the first place. Hmm. I'm not sure what to do about this. Would it clear if the cable was oriented differently? Yeah, that just about works. I've, managed, I've done a little bit of manhandling and we can get that to fit in. It's not perfect, but it's better than it was. All right, that'll do. One fan and one EPS connector that is not jammed into place. Fine. Let's take off the back cover and make sure that there's no nasty surprises back here, which is a mistake I've made in the past. Remember the Corsair 220T from Christmas that made me look like a Charlie because I didn't look in the back? Huh. A dual connector 8-pin. Fair enough. Right. This is an enormous jumble in here. I might do something about those cables. Um, these Cooler Master power supplies are very noodly and they're very difficult to sort out. Um, this is very difficult to actually fix. I'm not surprised that has happened. Uh, I, I've fitted one of these before and had exactly the same issue. Like, you, you take it out of the box and you're like, oh, that's easy. I'll just unravel and untangle all of these cables until they're nice and ordered and neat. And you, when, when you look at it, you realise that you can't because they're all going through holes in each other like some kind of horrifying origami. So yeah, 
not surprised at that. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna wail on him for that, but we'll see if we can do something about it. Um apart from that though, there's actually nothing wrong back here. Ah. This is why I don't like Molex connectors. Is that hot? I mean, that's a ground pin. So that's, ooh, yeah, that's been forced in. I'll give you a gory close up. You can see where that pin has sort of been pushed right back down and forced into the connector there. Not ideal. All right, that seems okay. Yeah, that's gone on. All right, that's sorted. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Molex pinout is 12005. Um, so these two center pins, these are zero volts or ground. So that guy sticking out, that wouldn't have been causing any problems, but hmm, you never know. Okay, uh, I'm just going to pull back some of these cables. So the nice Antec fans are look appear to be just Molex only, which makes me immeasurably sad because I actually thought these blue LED Antec fans looked quite nice. However, 12 volt Molex only, nah, that's pretty bad. Urgh. I freaking hate Molex connects. You've just got to jiggle them until they go in. There we go. And it's okay to stack Molex connectors like this. It's only fans. You may as well just put all of the horrifyingness in one place. There we go. All right. That basically looks exactly as it did. However, at least I know that everything is plugged in now. Oh, except to you, what are you? Uh, card reader, let's make sure that, that is plugged in. I don't think this was plugged in. However, I shall make it plugged in. Oh, that's interesting. <clears throat> Not been causing a problem, but just another thing I've spotted with this computer. So here we've got the USB 3 front panel connector. It comes here, plugs into the USB 3 front pa panel header port. And I noticed it had this little tail coming out and plugging into a USB 2 header. I assumed that it was some kind of combo cable that was carrying a single USB 3 and a single USB 2 to the front panel. However, the front panel actually has dual USB 2 and one USB 3. So that guy there, that's the dual USB 2. You can see that's going into a USB 2 header and it's got two rows of pins on it. So what's this guy then? This guy, um, if you don't have a USB 3 front panel header, then this tail is so you can plug the USB 3 port into a USB 2 header. So basically this USB 3 port has been plugged into two headers on the board at the same time. So I bet something very interesting happens if you try and plug something into the front USB 3 port. Basically, that guy should not be plugged in at all. I'm not going to chop that guy off because it's a bit of a thick boy cable. I'll zip tie that back just so it's out of the way. But now we've removed that, we can plug in the uh, front USB 2 card reader. So I'll get that guy plugged in. I can't do it at the moment because I've got all of my hands at the wrong angle to get the camera in there. But yeah, let's sort that out. Okay, that's that all sorted out. So we've sorted out the wiring enough anyway. We haven't done cable porn at the back, but it's fine. Good, let's turn it on and see if just sorting these little things out has done anything at all. I'm not expecting it to have been this easy. However, as I say, one thing at a time, the first thing we've done is just sort out the cabling. So if our problem disappears now, then it means that 
one of those little gremlins that we just resolved was what was causing some instability in the system. Nope, we are still kill. So I'm not particularly surprised by that, but that's fine. Now we know. Okay, so as I said earlier on, I'm going to move on to memory stuff. So the next thing I'm going to do... Um, actually, you know what? I'm just going to switch off XMP. Yeah, I'm going to turn off XMP. Let's reboot. So I'm going to spam the delete key on the keyboard to go into BIOS on restart. As soon as we hit the black screen, anyway. Okay, so XMP is a memory setting. So technically, any memory that's over 2666, I think, 2600, we'll call it, um, is classed as overclocked. And these overclocking profiles are called XMP, Extreme Memory Profile. Um, and um, uh, this is something that needs to be switched on in BIOS to work. And you buy your XMP memory, switch on the XMP profile, and it will, and it will put in a predetermined overclock to get the memory up to the speed that it's designed to run at. Um, however, now and then, XMP can cause problems, um, very commonly on bad motherboards, uh, but it can happen. So I'm going to turn that off, disable. So without XMP, it's going to tank our memory speed down to 2133, which is just the default speed for DDR4. So I'm going to go ahead and save that. And we're going to run the test again. Um, so, again, this is a long shot, however, XMP can sometimes cause problems, so we're going to switch that off. If it was an XMP issue, I would expect blue screen errors. Um, and in fact, even if we had faulty memory, I would expect blue screen errors. So, this problem, in fact, I don't think I even am going to run a memory test. We're going to run this just as an interest thing, but yeah, um, if we had memory issues, I would, ex I would expect blue screen errors. We are WinRAR. We got through all 100 passes. So it looks like XMP is our culprit. So I think what we'll do is we'll go for just a single pass. So I'm going to switch on XMP. We'll go for a fail. Then we'll turn it off again. And we'll go for another pass. What's the time? I'm working late tonight for this one. Um, yeah, I got time. That's going to take another hour. Yeah, let's do it. OK. So while we wait for this test to run, so just a reminder, XMP is back on again, so we're expecting it to fail this time. It's probably going to take 10 or 15 minutes to do so, though, although sometimes it seems to fail after, you know, a couple of minutes. Anyway, so what do we do if it is XMP? Because obviously our memory is now running down at 2133, which is going to hurt performance quite a lot. Well, not a huge amount. It, However, it, it could be knocking 10 or 15 FPS off of the um, game performance. And depending on what game you're running, that could be not really very much, or it could be a lot. You know, if you're already sitting at 150 FPS on a 60 hertz monitor, that's not really going to matter. However, if you're trying to get that 60 frames a second out of a AAA game, that's actually going to be hurting you quite a lot. So what can we do about this? The first thing I would recommend is a BIOS update on the motherboard, which is probably what I will do on this, um, because a newer BIOS would theoretically should improve things. Um, if nothing else, it will have newer AGESA and stuff like that, which is all of the AMD software that they've put into the BIOSes. And with a bit of luck, um, Gigabyte will have also done a little bit of work and a little bit of fine tuning. Um, and if nothing else, it might just be enough just to tweak the way that memory is handled enough that XMP is actually working properly. Another way of solving this would be to manually dial in memory timings. I have a video on this. Um, I can't remember what it's titled, but if you search my channel for XMP, um, then it'll come up with said video. And in that video, I demonstrate, uh, again, XMB, XMP causing issues, ironically with a gigabyte motherboard again, um, and how you can use, I've forgotten the name of the program, but how you can use a utility to manually generate some safe XMP timing settings that are almost guaranteed to work and that are just a little bit more fettled than the XMP profile is. It's an absolute ball ache to do it. However, if you've got no other options, that will probably make XMP work on a system that otherwise will not work. Another thing we could do is we could run this 3200 RAM at 3000 or 3100. 
Um, I would probably go. I would probably recommend going for three thousand over thirty one hundred because thirty one hundred is a weird number. But at any rate, if we went for three thousand, this would shave off a little bit of performance, but probably not enough for no to notice, and it would still put it almost a gigahertz higher than twenty one thirty three. So obviously, that is another point where we just we just downclock the memory ever so slightly to the point where the motherboard doesn't have an issue with it anymore. So that's another option as well. Um, the other possibility is, again, it's just bad memory. Um, it's probably worth my while running a mem test on this anyway, just to make sure it's not just straight up faulty RAM. And now we've actually proven that this is actually a memory related fault. Now, all of a sudden, I'm actually swinging back around to running mem test 86. So we'll run mem test 86 on this as well. Uh, once we've actually confirmed that this is an XMP issue, um, just to make sure that we don't actually have faulty RAM. I will run that memory test with XMP disabled, um, just so to make sure that we're looking for physical defects in the memory rather than just a squicky XMP profile. Um, so that's that. Another thing to discuss as well is uh, what if... Um, Intel burn test had passed from the get-go and I'd come up and I'd drawn a blank on this. What what then? Well, I started off with Intel burn test because um, this is a really quick application to run. I've got um, I've got Intel burn test and uh, hardware monitor sitting on all of my flash drives. It's part of my standard flash drive toolkit. So when I'm looking for problems, the first thing I'm going to do is just drag those two onto the desktop run both of them and just look at the numbers in hardware monitor and see if I can see anything that is clearly not right. I'm looking for temperatures that are, that are way out or, um, uh, or clocks that are not clocking correctly um, or just any kind of numbers that look wrong to me. Um, and that is it's a lot faster to just run up hardware monitor and Intel burning test than it is to start installing other utilities. So if this had drawn a blank, other utilities might include running uh, Cinebench R15 or Cinebench R20, which again is a heavy CPU heavy benchmark. Uh, we could also have run um, 3DMark Time Spy as a gaming benchmark, or failing that, we could also run um, uh, Unigen Heaven or Unigen Superposition as another gaming benchmark. Um, those again will run through. 3D Mark is a good one for catching out system instability because if it detects anything that's not quite right, it will invalidate your score. Whereas um, uh, stress tests like Heaven and Superposition, they might not crash. They, you might not see any visual issues. Whereas 3D Mark is a good one to run because it'll actually invalidate the benchmark score if there's a problem. The catch with 3D Mark is that it takes forever to run if you don't have the premium version. And if you do have the premium version, well, that costs money. Um, so, yeah. And also, all of these apps, you know, it takes time to install them. So, you, when you want just some quick numbers on the screen, not the best option, which is why I went for an IBT, first of all. Uh, another good test that you can pull out is good old Fermark. Um, Fermark is a good graphical stress test. It barely scratches the CPU. Um, it just hits the GPU pretty hard. Not so good for top-end graphics cards because it can't really max a top-end graphics card. Um, however, uh, low to medium-end graphics cards, no problem whatsoever. So that's another good option to run. And again, Fermark is very... You've got to install it, but it's very quick to install. And it's very quick to get that up and running to get some load into the graphics card. So those are the kinds of tests that I would have moved into next. I would have started running those one by one, perhaps even two at the same time, like Intel Burn Test and Fermark at the same time, just trying different things to see if we can catch the PC off guard. Uh, and if we're really stuck, you could even just ask the customer what games they play. However, in this case, no, no prizes for seeing that Fortnite icon on the desktop. I don't want to sit here and play Fortnite to figure out what's wrong with that. I don't play Fortnite. I don't know how to play it. So, uh, yeah, that's not an option I wanted to go down. However, thankfully, we've got, we had reproduction just on the first test I ran. So that's great. And uh, it'll be good if we get a fail in um, mem test as well. That'll be interesting. So uh, in any case, I'm going to walk away now and let this carry on running. We're, um, we're getting into the test. It's a shame we don't have a counter to see how far we've got to go, but... Uh, See you guys in a bit. 
Aha, victory! It failed again. Good. Right, that's good enough for me. It's clearly XMP. Um, I'm not going to do another test. Um, we got a pass with XMP off, and then it failed again when we switched XMP back on. That's good enough. So, uh, next up is Memtest. As I mentioned, we're going to run Memtest on it and see if we've got faulty modules. I don't think we have. I think this is just purely an XMP issue. However, it'd be really dumb uh, not to test the memory at this point. Um, yeah, okay. So, Memtest86. Um, where do you get this from these days? I haven't made a Memtest86 flash drive in a long time. Most of my most of my diagnostic flash drives I made years ago, so yeah. Uh, let me see. Google mem the mem test eighty six. Yeah, it's memtest eighty six dot com. And when you hit download, that will download this handy little zip file. And in there, it's got an exe that'll make you your USB flash drive. It's also got an uh, an image file there, so you could burn a CD if you're that kind of person still. Uh, <laughs> Make of that what you will. <laughs> yeah, so you can make your own flash drive. Um, so yeah, that's how you get Memtest 86. Let's run it. Funny. I'm sure I've run Memtest on a Ryzen before. But, nah, whatever. Okay, right. I am going to leave this to run. Um, I'm not sure how long the current version takes to go, because it's jumped up to 25% already on the first pass, but we'll see. I'll step away and leave that for a bit. So uh, the numbers we're looking for on this screen, because I have had people ask before, um, so it's writing, it's writing loads of data to memory and then verifying that it's correct, and it's writing the memory in very specific patterns designed to catch out faulty modules. Um, so for example, you have like, in this case, this is moving inversions. So it's putting, it's putting opposing bits high and low directly next to each other. So if you've got two high bits with a low bit in the middle, on a faulty memory module, having two highs on each side might just flip the one in the middle over to high as well, which would be an error. So it's deliberately writing inver an inversion of highs and lows across the memory. And then it's checking to see if any of them have accidentally flipped onto the wrong position. That's a very, very generalized overview. But that's the kind of thing that you're doing when you're testing memory. There's lots of other things you do as well. You can just write random garbage data and then read it back. Row hammering where you're just flashing the, the memories on and off and things like that. All kinds of things. Um, so yeah. Uh, then in the middle of the screen, it says pass one of four. So on the modern version of mem test, it will do four passes and then stop testing. You can change that in the configuration if you want. Oh, there we go. Ah. Oh, XMP is still turned on. Okay, we'll, we'll get to this in a sec. As I was saying, you can change the number of passes it will do in the configuration if you want it to run all night. What we're looking for is the error counter. So on the right it says errors one. We have actually hit an error. So um, yeah, we actually have memory errors now. Because XMP is still on, because I forgot to disable it before running this test, this could be a false positive. This doesn't mean our memory is faulty. It just means we have memory issues. This is just telling us what we already knew. As the test goes on, we'll probably see it clock up more errors. However, any errors at all are a fail. Um, this is not a case of, oh, it's, a, it's just one error. Any errors are a fail. There is no glancing blow with this. There is no, oh yeah, it'll be fine. One error means it's failed. Um, quite often, if you have a faulty module, it'll start clocking up tens, hundreds, or thousands of errors. So this is very minor, but fail is a fail. Okay, let's quit out of this because, um, yeah, it's failed. There is no point in running the test any further. Escape. That's the wrong keyboard. So I'm going to switch off XMP and I'm going to run the same test again. Uh, well, I'm actually going to change tactic because I tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to turn off XMP and the memory's going to pass. That is exactly what's going to happen. I'm going straight in with the BIOS update because that is my that's my goal for actually fixing this problem is a BIOS update. 
So I'm going to jump, I'm going to try and save myself some time and jump ahead. We're going to do the BIOS update and then we're going to run the test again, once again with XMP turned on. Because if we get a pass with XMP on, then that means we win. So time for BIOS update. What version have we got at the moment? Uh, BIOS version F50. BIOS date, uh, 27th of the 11th, 19. Oh, this is quite a new BIOS. Uh-oh. Let's see if there's a newer one. So this is a B450 DS3H. Oh, so BS, uh, B450M DS3H. Yep. Da -da 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 -da. Support. BIOS. Yeah, this is already on the newest BIOS. Uh-oh. Okay, well, that's scuppered the BIOS update plan. Um, we could drop it to a lower BIOS. However, I really don't think that's going to help us. Okay, let's do a test. Let's drop the memory to XMP3000 and run memtest again and see if that gets through. Because if that passes, then this is just a bad... I don't know, I want to say it's just a bad matchup. Is this memory on the QVL list? That's another thing we can check. I'm going to go over to CPU support. Support list, that's what I want. We have a Summit Ridge CPU, which is the Ryzen 2000 series. Okay, right, what memory is this? CMK16GX. 4M2B3. Ah, uh, so the memory kit that's in this computer is not officially supported by the motherboard. Now, this is something that I never check for when I'm building computers, for the record. I never bother checking QVLs. But this is a perfect example of how you can get caught up. Arguably, at this point, we can't blame this on the motherboard because the motherboard never claimed to support this memory. Is there actually... 3200 memory on the support list yeah right at the top here um, there's an eight gigabyte kit so it's very close so yeah that's probably our issue though um i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna drop the memory to 3000 that's probably gonna work and honestly i think that's gonna be my recommendation moving forward for now so let's go memory settings and I'm just going to change the system memory module, multiply it down to 30. Right, let's save that. And I'm going to F12 for the boot menu again. We're 24 minutes into the test and the error has not reappeared. Um, so yeah, at this point I'm satisfied that running at 3000 seems to have solved our issue. Um, so we've got a choice now. Um, it's, I'm going to kick it out like this, um, basically. Uh, what I'm going to do now, it's late in the evening. I'm going to leave this running overnight, come in tomorrow morning and confirm that it got through all four passes. Uh, and then if it got through all four passes, I'm going to send this, I'm going to send this PC on its way. Um, well, actually, no, I, I lie. I'm going to defrag the hard drive and then send it on its way because that hard drive was heckin' fragmented. Um, obviously, a sensible build, this would have an SSD in it and that wouldn't be an issue, but yeah, whatever. Um, so what other options have we got? Well, you could... I'm sure if we drill through that QVL list, there'll be a 16 gig memory kit. Uh, well, no, actually, there were no 16 gig 3200 memory kits that were on the QVL list. This is just a low-end motherboard that's trying to run, I don't want to say high-end components, but mid-range and pushing components, you know. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not super exotic memory. I don't know. This is one of the reasons why I've kind of fallen out of love with Gigabyte. I've just seen a bit too much of this with Gigabyte in the past year or so. Um, I had sort of gone all in with Gigabyte after having a bad time with MSI, who are my old flame, but I'm kind of flipped around again. But that much being said, 
uh, MSI have not been perfect either. They have they're in, they have an inconsistent track record. So it might just be worth just going all in and just saying, you know what, just spend a bit extra and buy an Asus, but whatever. It depends on your build. I'm not going to get into the debate of which motherboard brand is the best right now. It depends. There's no straight answer to that. It depends what you're building. It depends on the budget. It depends on what's going in it, what it's going to do, etc., etc. Um, at any rate, I'm going to kick this out at um, XMP3000 because that has solved our problem. Uh, if you have a problem similar to this and you're like, no, I bought 3200 RAM. I want it to run a bloody 3200. Well, in that case, check out my other video. And I'll stick a card in there. Uh, that links to it, and I'll put a link in the description down below as well that links to my other video about XMP issues that explores a very similar problem to this and the hard way of solving it, which involves dialing in custom memory timings that are just a little bit more lax or just a little bit more refined uh, that will probably get... I mean, if I did custom memory timings on this, we'd probably get it back up to 3200 without any errors. But I don't want to do that on a customer PC because... Um, mainly if this BIOS gets reset for whatever reason, then a page of custom memory timings will need to be re-entered again. Whereas at the moment, if the BIOS gets reset for whatever reason, then I can just say to the customer, you go into the BIOS, you turn on XMP, and you set the multiplier to 30. That's it. And you're not going to spot the difference between 3000 and 3200. Like, it's going to be a couple of FPS, maybe, maybe. And most of the time, it'll probably be in the margin of error. So suffice to say, we're just going to run this RAM at 3000 and it'll be fine. So that's it. Thank you very much for tuning in, everyone. Um, I will see you all in the next video. Bye for now.